All right, guys, welcome to RC Mojo. This week, we're still working on the Clodbuster. There's a couple of things to be getting on with, but the most interesting bit is the motors have turned up. I spent a while hunting for a pair of Brush Trinity, Reedy, or even Demon motors, but they're not easy to find. And most of the ones I did see were quite well past their best. A bit of a shame, but we're well into the brushless era now, so it's not all that surprising. Instead, I ended up with a pair of modern Surpass Hobby 13 turn motors. You can find them for under a tenner each, so they're never going to be as well made as the old ones, but I've had good luck with their 35 and 45 turn motors in crawlers and the 80 turn in Tamiya lorries, so I'm fairly optimistic they're going to work okay. Also, mainly just for fun, I've got a pair of clip on motor heat sinks. The motors will generate a little bit of heat, but they'd probably be just fine without. The main thing is they'll add a bit more contrast if you peer in over the axle. Before we get to the motors, there's a couple of other bits to mention first. Since you last saw the chassis, I've added 7mm to each side, adding to the width. So now we can use full steering lock without the tyres touching the lower links. And I've also updated the antenna mount a little, so it's screwed down rather than using the servo tape. With the length of the tube, there was just too much leverage for the tape to hold. Now it's super sturdy, so it won't be falling off any time soon. Right, first job of the day then. We're going to extend the wheelbase by one hole front and back. This should improve stability at speed at the cost of turning circle and a bit of agility. Remember, when I mounted the body, I mounted it a little bit too far forward, so moving the front axle forward will help it look a bit more balanced. To make it easier to see what's going on, I'll take the front wheels off, but you can easily change the wheelbase while the wheels are still on. Another advantage, we'll get a little bit more clearance between the back of the motor and the edge of the chassis. It doesn't matter much, but it certainly won't hurt. OK, with the chassis flipped over, we can start taking out some screws. First, there's the screw that goes through the ball ends, the chassis, and threads into the brass tube, one on each side. Take them out, and that releases one of the brass tubes. We'll also remove the frontmost brass tube so we can evenly rearrange them. It's funny how brass seems to have become so popular on RC trucks. There was some around on the very vintage models, but it was replaced with steel, aluminium and plastic pretty quickly. Even the Tamiya re-releases often swapped it for other materials. These days you can replace most of a Traxxas TRX4 with aftermarket brass bits. Some are useful for adjusting the centre of gravity down and possibly forwards, but a lot of them seem to be there just to look nice. On this chassis I can't see them helping hugely with the weight distribution, but they certainly hold a thread better than aluminium, and when the truck flips over they do look quite nice. Anyway, enough about brass, we need to refit the tube for mounting the lower links one hole further out. For now just fitting the screws loosely until the other brass tube goes in too. I'm going to fit the other tube two holes towards the centre, so they'll be fairly evenly spaced. The main thing is that they're going to take the brunt of any impact if the chassis hits something, landing a jump. The rear end is exactly the same as the front of course, we just need to swap all the brass bits round. Then, once everything is in the right place, tighten up all the screws. Although, the chassis is so stiff, even without the brass bits, it's not going to matter much. Flipping the chassis over, we can move the top links next. They're attached with a screw and nylock nut, so all we do is take the screw out, then refit them one hole forwards. Super simple. I did forget to move the dampers in the video, which I rectified before the first run. The top mounts just need moving one hole to match the links. Now you can see there's a bit more clearance around the end of the motor. And with the new motors fitted, there's not going to be any worry about things getting pinched. Right, that's the wheelbase sorted. Let's play with the new motors. Actually, first we need to remove the leads from the old motors. We just need to heat them up with the solder gun and take the leads away from the terminals. Now from the other side we can undo the two motor mount screws and remove the motor. And now due to technical difficulties of me thinking I was recording when I wasn't, here we have the pinion from the old motor fitted to one of the new ones. The only thing I really missed was measuring the distance between the outside of the pinion and the face of the motor so we get the pinion in the right spot. On the clod axles with the cover on and the screws done up you really can't see the pinion to set the position so it's easier just to carry it over. 
Also, I pointed out that these motors are set to a zero degree forward timing. I'll pop up a photo so you can see. Noting the timing mark on the end bell is in line with the gap between the magnets. There's a rather good video from Holmes Hobbies that covers timing in far more detail. I'll pop a link in the description. OK, if we clip the heatsink over the motor, we can see, as often happens, it's not going to be quite as easy as I'd hoped. Because the upper link mounts partially sit over the motor, there's not enough space for the heatsink. Even if we push it right up to the end bell, there's still not quite enough room. Well, these heat sinks were really cheap, so I think we'll just have to cut a section out so they do fit. If we offer the motor up to the gearbox and thread in the mounting screws a turn or two, we can mark and measure up. I think just to keep things simple, we'll just cut away some of the long fins, so we'll mark where the cut ends. And measure up how much we need to cut away. Now it doesn't need to be all that precise, so I'm just going to eyeball it from above with the vernier. Looks like it's roughly 7mm. Now we can pop the heatsink off and mark a line 7mm from the edge, so we've got a line to follow. Now usually I have access to an array of fun power tools, but at the moment all I have is a large pillar drill, a scroll saw really meant for plywood, and a dremel. None of those are really going to help much here, so I went old school and stuck it in a vise and attacked it with a slightly blunt hacksaw. Far from ideal, but it's worked well enough. The cut isn't all that straight, but it'll do. Once it's all fitted, you'll have to look pretty closely to actually notice. With that done, we can pop the heatsink back on the motor, offer it up to the gearbox and thread in the two screws. Now if you spin the chassis around, you can see the heatsink sits nicely around the upper link mount, making the motor look a bit more interesting than just more of that black hole. OK, next up, more soldering. Now because we've got that behind the axle steering kit, access to the front terminal on the motor isn't going to be all that good. So before we start soldering, we're going to remove the knuckle so we can pivot the carbon link out of harm's way. If we go in for a better camera angle, you can see we've got fairly good access to the terminals. We're going to solder to the bottom terminals, so from the top you won't easily be able to see the motor wires. It should all look super clean and neat. First then, we need to tin the motor terminals with some solder. To make it flow a bit easier, I'm going to use a smear of flux first, so we get a nice flow and a good joint. We need to heat up the terminal and feed in some solder, so we've got a nice little pool. You don't have to go mad and have solder dripping off, you just need a nice little blob that should end up looking smooth and not spiky or lumpy. If it does, add more flux and reflow. With the terminals tinned, we can hold the wire near the terminal and use the iron to reheat the terminal. Then lift the iron out of the way, quickly position the wire and reapply the iron to melt the joint. Once you've got good flow, take the iron away and keep hold of the wire for a couple of seconds. Now this joint is good enough, but it's not ideal, so I'll probably end up redoing it. It's the usual story where I'm doing this by peering around a camera, so I can't really see what I'm doing. A little dab of flux and a reflow will sort it out into a nice smooth joint. The other terminal is exactly the same. Solder up the wire and we can refit the knuckle. There we go, that's the front motor swapped. We just need to do the exact same thing with the rear. Other than the steering getting in the way, it's exactly the same procedure, so I'll just cut to it being complete. There we go. Right, before we pop the tyres back on, we should just quickly check that the motors are spinning the right way. There's not much to it, we just need to connect up the battery with the transmitter powered up, and turn on the ESC. Now we already know the radio is correctly set up, as all we've changed are the motors. So if we pull the trigger, we should hopefully see both axles spinning forward. And we do. Excellent. If one of them had been going backwards, we just need to swap the wires on the motor, or swap the motor connectors around, so no big deal. But it's working perfectly as is, so let's put the wheels back on. Well, not too surprisingly, it doesn't really look any different. I think we should really put the body back on to see if the overbite looks any better. And yeah, I think it does. The front of the body still sticks out a bit, but just extending the wheelbase that little bit has made it look quite a bit better. But that's not what you want to see, we need to head out and see how it runs. 
First, of course, I just cruised up and down a few times, going forwards and reverse at maybe 20% throttle to give the brushes a chance to bed in before letting rip. For the first minute or two, the motors did sound very scratchy. Now, though, they're running very nicely. First, we have my dad trying to drive the truck with some degree of success. You see, now we've got that extra amount of oomph, it's exposed some weaknesses in the build. First, and most obvious, is those old tyres aren't great. The old clod tyres are pretty stiff when new, and these ones are 20 years old, so they're not quite as supple as they used to be. Also, with the extra power, the rear toe is far more important. Currently, it's somewhere near zero degrees, so if we set it to a degree or two of toe in, it's going to help the truck track straight. Next, I had a go at driving, and all I can say is it's a bit of a handful, especially on the road. There's a fair amount of mud on the surface, so it is quite slippery. The main thing I noticed, other than the tyres, was because the diffs are so free to spin, if you've got any steering input under acceleration, the inside tyre lights up, sending it off course to one side or the other. Grippier tyres are going to help a lot, but changing the open diff for a ball diff would help a lot too. That way we can set the tension, giving a limited slip effect. The trouble is, the best clod ball diff was from Thundertech Racing, made by MIP, which hasn't been on sale for a number of years. So finding one, or better yet two, would be quite tricky to say the least. Integi make a copy of it, but from what I've read it's not the most reliable, assuming you can make it work in the first place. Another thing that probably doesn't help, the old Carson dampers have lost a good 30% of their oil now, so damping is rather compromised. Anyway, I'm going to leave you with some sliding about. We've still got some upgrades to tackle, but I think I'll have to save up some more pocket money first. Those aftermarket clod tyres are a little bit expensive. As always then, thanks for watching, like if you like, subscribe if you haven't, and leave a message if there's something on your mind. Bye guys!